So let me start sharing. Does it work? Yeah, it's just very slow. Can you see my yeah. screen now? Yep. Okay, I will start now. Uh, so, for this week uh, is someone talking? Okay, I'll start. So, hi everyone, I'm Yu, and today I'm going to talk about uh, our work in a network perspective of extracting complements and substitutes from sales data. And this is a joint work together with Sebastian, Alistair, and Renaud. So I'm a DFU student here at Oxford, and I'm part of the CDT in industrially focused mathematical modeling. So the same as Rodrigo. And in, my, in our research project, we also have an industrial partner who will provide us the real problem to solve. And for me, the industrial partner is Tesco. That's why I also work with Seb Sebastian and Alistair from the Tesco DSS team. And I think Sebastian is here. Would you like to say hello to us now? Yeah. yeah, I was just waving. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Yeah, and uh, Renaud is my uh, supervisor here at Oxford. Um, so in today's talk, I plan to first do the introduction. So what are complements and substitutes and why are they interesting to us? And then I will introduce our methods to extract them from sales data. And after these, I will show our results in both an illustrative example where we know the true and line relationship and also the real world sales data where we don't know the relationship between products. So I will also show the validation we have done from other data sites. And finally, I will summarize our work. Um, so first and foremost, why are we interested in complements and substitutes? Um, at least because the understanding of the interaction between products is very fundamental and essential in both economic and marketing research, as well as our everyday life. For example, to design the product catalog and to arrange the layout of products in both actual and online stores and to determine the stock level of different products, as well as your promotion strategies. Um, there are two central concepts in the product relationships. One is complement products and the other is substitute products. So complement products such as hot dog and hot dog bun are sold separately, but they use together. They normally have more value when consumed together than alone. Uh, while substitute products such as different kinds of blue brace, they can be used in place of each other. Yeah. Specifically, the degree of complementarity is defined through the negative cross-price elasticity demand, which is a derivative of demand with respect to price. So if we reduce the price of one product, we would expect the demand of the other go up. And these increase can be different for different products. Uh, similarly, the degree of substitutability is defined through the positive cross-price elasticity demand. So now if we increase the cross price of one product, the demand of the other will go up. And these increase can be different for different products as well. So now with both understandings, we can give our initial objective, which is to extract both the product relationships and they degrade from the data. Then the problem is, what data do we have? So we mainly use the sales transaction data provided by Tesco, which is easily accessible in practice. So we know in which store, on which date, the quantity of products that are in the same transaction. So we can consider transaction as the basket. So this transaction ID will give a unique code for each shopping trip of each customer. So this is really the key to trace back the products that are in the same transaction or in the baskets. 
So now we can further restrict our objective, and it is now to extract both the product relationships and their degrees from the sales data we have. Also, apart from these, uh, we also have the product hierarchy data provided by Tesco, uh, where products are grouped together according to uh, increasingly generic categories. So uh, at the lowest level, each one corresponds to a different product, including the same one, but of different sizes or of different flavors. And the higher the level is, the more generic the corresponding category is. So for example, for the product bananas five pack, it's level two category is bananas. And then it's level three category is fruit. And also we use two data sites in a paper in food size. So one is the correspondence between ingredients and our flavor compounds. And the other is the correspondence between ingredients and the recipes. Since all these data sites show some other perspectives of, the, of our products, so we will use them for validation. So now since we have some like a more specific objective, we would like to know what has been done in the literature so we know where to start. And the work to identify the product relationship can be dated back to at least the 1960s when Saito proposed these constant elasticity of substitution production model. And the parameters can be interpreted as a degree of complementary uh, substitutability or complementarity after some transformation. Uh, but the data he used, the aggregate data, loses crucial information of the co-purchases. So a small a, so a small stream of literature uses individual data. For example, Song and Ching Takonda proposed these indirect utility model of four categories. So a utility function quantifies a, a customer's preference over a site of products. And these indirect utility function will use the features of other products, for example, their price and their variables here. Mm, but still, the site of interested products is independent, uh, is determined a priori, for example, by field expertise. And the analysis is restricted to a small number of products. The breakthrough of this problem comes with um, applying machine learning algorithms. So the basic idea here is to consider products in the baskets as words in sentences. Then the problem to analyze product property from basket data is similar in spirit to estimate the semantic attributes from sentences. So they are mostly embedding-based methods. For example, Grace et al. proposed these sequential probabilistic model of consumer choice in 2019. Yeah. Um, however, uh, the distance between products is not really well defined in the basket data. And as for most machine learning algorithms, the interpretation of these selective features is not clear. And also they lack specific criteria to determine the product relationships. Uh, and they, they also don't analyze the interaction between complements and substitutes. Plus, some of them are already computationally extensive now. Um, hence, we add more requirements to our objective. And now our overall objective is to um, extract both the product relationships and their degrees from the sales data in a sensible, interpretable, and uh, interaction-friendly and efficient way. So this is where we come up with the idea to propose a network-based approach for this problem. So now I will introduce our method. So before diving into specific details, I want to give an overview of our modeling ideas. So what we have is the sales transaction data. So we know which products are in the same transaction on specific dates. And then we can construct the product purchase network. So as shown in this figure, so we have two sets of nodes, one for transactions shown as a blue square here, and the other um, uh, 
products shown as the right circles here. So these two are connected if this product was purchased in this transaction. So for example, these three products are all connected with this transaction. It means these three products are both together by this transaction. And also we know the formal definition of complements and substitutes and some of their characteristics. And from these, we can propose some assumptions which can be interpreted as the connectivity patterns in the network. So now products of different relationships are then product nodes of different connectivity patterns and which are actually shows in the network. So the problem to extract the different relationship like complements and substitutes from the sales data is really to extract these specific rows from the network, the so-called row extraction. Uh, so now we have the sales transaction data and then we can construct the network. What we need are the assumptions. Then here they are. So we know the formal definition is defined through the price demand relation and demand is generally a decreasing function of price. So we can directly use the interpretation of the demand demand relation that is a purchase pattern in this network. So specifically, we propose four assumptions here. We assume complements uh, are always in the same transaction, such as the hot dog three and hot dog bound one in these uh, figure A here. So they have significantly more common neighbors and the degree of complementarity is positively related to how similar they are in the same transaction. And also, we assume substitutes are not in the same transaction. For example, the tackle seasoning one and tackle seasoning two in this figure B here. But they are both with the same products. For example, the tackle shell two in this figure B. So they should have significantly less common neighbors, but they share the same complements. And we assume the degree of substitutability is positively related to how similar their complements are. So generally, rows are defined as nodes of similar connectivity patterns. And our assumptions here really restrict the specific connectivity pattern of our specific rows, which makes general row extraction method not applicable here. And here we show some examples of our expected complement row and substitute row, and also, and also the results from applying general row extraction method. And note here we have a very big network, and this is only part of it. So our complement row could coincide with the general one. But for the substitute row, if we apply general extraction method, then uh, the results will not only include the substitute, but also the complement of these. So, sorry, you can I ask a question? Yes, please. I'm not familiar with what a general role is. Can, can you tell me? Oh, it's like general role, it's like they share the same connectivity pattern. It's like these two nodes are both connected with these uh, transactions, yeah. but these, like they both connected to these. So they are kind of both similar to each other. Okay, okay. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, so um, this is not desired for us. We don't want this row. Yeah, so we propose our customized row extraction method here. And again, I, I want to first show the overview of our method. So now we know what our specific rows are, what they look like, and they are characterized by these assumptions. And we want to first use assumptions one and three to propose a complement and substitute instance network. So they are only, they are like networks only of products. And from these, we can determine the product relationships. So we know whether two products are complements or then substitutes or just independent. And then we will use assumptions two and four to propose some measures to quantify the degrees. And then from these, together with the results from assumption one and three, we can construct complement and substitute weighted network. And from these, we can determine both the relationships and the degrees. And with the weighted network, we will apply 
community detection algorithm on this weighted network to gather, finally gather complementing substitute rows. These are for the product groups, where inside of each row, products are mostly complement of each other. And inside the substitute row, products are mostly substitutes of each other. So this is our row extraction pathway. We will start from step one, which is to, uh, to construct the complement and substitute instance network. And we will use assumption one and three here, and both of them are based on the significance test on the number of common neighbors. So our what we have done can be summarized in this diagram. So starting from the product purchase network, we propose several null models, and these can be used to get the distribution of the number of common neighbors. Then, to, then we can perform the significance test, and then we can construct two product networks, one for significantly more incidents, and the other for significantly less incidents. After this, by assumption one, the complement instance network is directly the significantly more one. And then by assumption three, if we want to get the substitute instance network, we first construct an indicator matrix of why the two products share complements. And then we do element-wise multiplication with the significantly less network adjacency, adjacency matrix. Yeah. Uh, so, so then we have the complement and substitute instance networks. From these, we can determine the product relationship. So the problem here is really what non-models do we use here? And the first one is a warrant of bipartite erdos schirani model. So we know erdos uh, ER models assume a fixed probability for each edge to appear. And the bipartite one will only allow edges between the two sets of nodes. And in our warrant, we will further assign a different probability, PI, for each product I to be connected. Um, so for each transaction node, uh, for each transaction node, the probability to connect with both product nodes I and J is PI times PJ. And then the number of common neighbors is a uh, binomial random variable with parameters NT and PI times PJ, where NT is the number of transaction nodes. And this distribution can be approximated by the normal one with the same mean and variance as nt goes to infinity. And we will use this approximation in the following significance test. Mm, the other normal model we use is the bipartite configuration model. So now we know configuration model will preserve the degree of each node by assigning di stubs to each node's i and connecting them uniformly at random. So the difference, um, so the difference with the previous model is that for the transaction nodes, we also have some different probability to be connected. And now the co-connecting incidence of a transaction node L with both I and J is an of a newly random variable of probability P I L J. And this probability, that is um, transaction no L is connecting with both I and J is proportional to all their degrees, so DI, DL, DJ. So these can be different for different L. Then the sum of it, which is the number of common neighbors, is not necessarily a binomial random variable here, but a Poisson binomial random variable. So with both non-models, we can get a distribution of the number of common neighbors. And then we significance levels alpha m for significantly more and alpha l for significantly less. We can perform significance tests on the num actual number of common neighbors, that is, this small c and i j, as follows. So we see it is significantly more if the probability that this number is greater than this small c and i j is less than alpha m. And we see it is significantly less if the probability that this number is less than this small c and i j is less than alpha l. So with this test, and then if we go back to our diagram, we can go all the way down to our complement instance network and substitute instance network 
from these, we can determine the product relationship. So this is our step one. Now we will move on to step Nelson. two. Yeah. Nelson, in, um, so the previous slides, where, where you do the, the null models, did you actually try that out in the data? Did you see if like, if you take a random shop and then two, or like a random basket and two products, yeah. if uh, these distributions sort of look like the model you have? Sorry, what do you mean? The so you, you in, the, in the previous slide still, you formulate these null models, right? Um, you mean in this model? Yeah, so this one, for instance, did you see what, if, if the, the data you have looks like this? Because mean, here, what, what you do with your test is to see if two products are substitutes or um, complements, and then so that they behave like significantly different from if they would be two random products. Yeah, yeah. You look like for two random products, what it looks like for them to like their number of common neighbors. Ah, uh, actually, I have an illustrative example where we know there are some independent products. And right. then with these null models, we can leave it out. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Just, just I'm asking you to see if this, how sensible this model is. But yeah, it does make sense, I think. Okay. Yeah, thanks. It's fine. Should I move on to step two here? Yep. Okay. So step two is really to get the complementing substitute weighted network. So we start from assumption two to quantify the degree of complementarity. And really we need to quantify how frequently products are in the same transaction. And to do so, we consider the random walks on the network. And so specifically for each node i at time t equal to zero, we impose an impulse on the product side, which is E i, and it only has one in its i's position and zero otherwise. And then we record the response of this impulse after one step, which is y i one, and it's equal to pp transpose times y zero. And pp transpose is a transition matrix from product nodes to transaction nodes. So since we have a bipartite network here, we use a bioadjacency matrix, which is AB from the transaction nodes to product nodes. And DP is the degree of product nodes. So the transition matrix PP here is equal to DP inverse times AB transpose. And then finally, we can compute the weighted cause and similarity between these responses. YI1 and YJ1, with the weights being the inverse of the transaction nodes, DT. And we will use these as the basis to propose our measures. So the first measure we use is directly the weighted cause and similarity we considered previously, and we name it the original measure. And after simplification, it can be shown as equation one here. Um, so specifically, ALI is the ALI element of this AB, this biogenesis matrix of the product purchase network. So ALI equal to one. If product L is purchased by transaction L, is product I is purchased by transaction L, so which is L is the neighbor of node I, then ALI times ALJ is equal to one if L is the common neighbor of both I and J. And DLT is the degree of transaction node L. So for this measure, it counts each common neighbor as one over its degree and sum them together. And then for the normalize it by this weighted sum from all I's neighbors and all J's neighbors and get the square root. So this measure will reach its maximum value of one if all of IOG's neighbors is also a neighbor of the other. Yeah, and we can also write this weighted sum inside the square root and get a form similar to a geometric mean of the, like the different portion of this weighted sum that is shared by the other nodes. We know there may be some noise in the data, so we also propose a randomized measure to help rectify the measure values. 
So the idea here is to propose some random models, random bacteria models characterized by these biogenesis matrix AR here. And then we compute, we use it to explain the noise in the data. And then we we'll compute the weighted neighbor from this model and then subtract it from this measure. That's how we get this randomized measure. So with both measures, we can, like together with the complement instance network, we can get a complement weighted network. Then we can move on to assumption four for the degree of substitutability. So this is to measure how similar their complements are. And to do so, we characterize each product I by a vector of its complementarity scores with other products. And then we compute the cause and similarity of these vectors. We use it as the substitutability measure here and as shown in equation three. Uh, where the WIK superscript C is the IG element in these W superscript C, which is the weight matrix in the complement weighting network. And this measure will be named after the complementarity measure used here. So this is about our assumption four. And I now I want to do a synthesis of both our measures and the results from assumption one and three. So starting from the product purchase network, we propose some measures for complementarity. And then by assumption one, we have this complement instance network. Then we can get the complement weighting network by element-wise multiplying its adjacency with the measure values. And then start from here, we propose some measures for substitutability. And together with the results from assumption three of the substitute instance network, we can get the substitute weighting network by element-wise multiplying these adjacency with the measure values. So with both weighted networks, we can obtain both the product relationships and the degrees. So this is about our step two. And now I will move on to step three for the complement and substitute rows. Uh, so the, both of these rows are defined through specific, uh, like product nodes of specific connective patterns in the BACTA network. But now we have the complement and weight, complement and substitute weighting networks. So they are really nodes that are densely connected in either the complement weighting network or the substitute weighting network. So they are classic communities. And then we can apply community detection algorithms here. And among the minor efficient algorithms, we use the map equation. So it's very similar to modularity maximization. So it has an objective function shown as the LC here, which is derived from the expected code lens to describe the trajectory of random walkers on the network. And it aims to minimize these expected code lens with respect to different partitions of the nodes. Since it is a quite standard method, and it's not the focus of our method here. So we will not explain the details of this algorithm, but give the reference here, if you're interested. So this is about our step three. And before we move on to the results part, I wanna do a little bit review of our, of our method here. So what we have done is to starting from the, our understanding of the roles in the network, and then use assumption one and three to get a complement and substitute instance network. And then the complement substitute weighted network. And we will call the weights in the complement weighted network our complementarity scores, and the weights in the substitute one our substitutability scores. And then from here, we get the complement and substitute rows. So these are mostly our methods. And now I will move on to the results from different kinds of data. Uh, so I first show the results in an illustrative example where, no, where we know the true and line relationship between products. So specifically, we create the following imaginary world. And in this world, coffee, ramen, candy, and webs are independent products. So, uh, so they are purchased independently but they are like preferred by our customers. So they are purchased very frequently. 
and held dog one, two, and three form a substitute group, similar to held dog gun one and two, tackle shell one and two, tackle Sydney one and two. So products in the same square form a substitute group, and products connected by the line above them form the complementary pairs. So in this world, uh, each customer in each shopping trip buy at most one complementary pair, and they never buy only one product in a pair. And also customers are sensitive to price, but the sensitivity to independent products is different from that of the complementary pairs because the price change of one product will also in influence the other. So we consider them as a whole here. So they are like different complementary pairs and we choose from it. And so as shown in this diagram, for each customer in each shopping trip, there is like different price level of these different complementary pairs. And then customers have different probability to buy it. So with all these rules, we generate 1,000 transactions for our analysis. And now we are ready for our results. So I first show the um, measures on the products. So both the x-axis and the y-axis are the product indices in the, uh, the same as the order of these products are introduced in the imaginary world. So the first four products are independent and the next three form a substitute group, similar as the next two, the following two and the last two. And the first two substitute group form complementary pairs, similar as the last two substitute groups. And on the left, I show the number of co-purchases. So for each IJ element in this plot, uh, it shows the number of co-purchases between product I and product J. So we can see for, car, uh, for independent products, it has roughly the same number of co-purchases with other products um, as a number between complementary pairs. And in the middle and on the right, I show our complementarity scores induced by the original measure, you know, so the randomized configuration measure. So in both measures, only the value between the complementary pairs have positive value. So it really retries the complementary pairs in this world. And we know for the substitutability measure, we use the complementarity score with other products as, as your characteristic vector and compute the cause and similarity. So only products in the same substitute group will have the positive value. So these will also like retry the two substitutes. Then we can look at the product network. So where each node represents a different product and they are connected by both the complement instance and the substitute instance. So complement instance in black and substitute instance in orange. And products in different color are like in different substitute, a substitute row. So now we can see really we retrieve the true substitute group in this world. So since our method works well for this uh, illustrative example, then we will move on to the more noisy real world sales data. So we start from the PIWAS relationship. So now we can consider a situation where we have some query products and we need some, we need is top complements and top substitutes for further analysis, like what we mentioned in the introduction. So if we apply our method, we will give these results. So for the query product organic blueberries, the top, comp a top substitute from our method is blueberries. And then for loose cucumbers, the top substitute would be organic loose cucumbers. And for salad tomatoes, the top substitutes would be other kinds of tomatoes. So these are also consistent with our understanding of substitutes because they can serve the same purpose. And if we look at these loose cucumbers and its top complements from our method are different kinds of tomatoes and they are also like substitutes of each other. So this is consistent with our assumption three 
that the substitutes share the same complements. Now we move on to the product groups. So here I show the uh, complement row of berries on the left and complement row of stir fry on the right. Uh, so in both plots, each node represents a different product and they are connected by both the complement instance in black and substitute instance in orange. And so we can see in both product groups, nodes are very densely connected by the complement instance. And they can form some complete graph, for example, the triangle in the dashed triangle here. Um, but still, there are some substitutes included, for example, the blueberry and the organic blueberry. Um, for substitute rows, I show the one of addings on the left and the one of apples on the right. And so here's the both of like all of the nodes, these black edges and the orange edges are the same as before. And so we can see in both substitute rows, nodes are now densely connected by substitute instance. But and they can, yeah, and they can form some complete graph, such as the triangle here. Mm, but still, there are some complements included in the substitute row. So we see the interaction between complements and substitutes is complex. It's not just assortative or disassortative. So this is about our main results from the sales data. And then we would like to know, like, do our extracted product relationship have other characteristics except these purchase pattern? So here's our validation. So we first use the product hierarchy data and we focus particularly on the L3 category um, consisting of fruit, organic produce, prepared produce, salad, and vegetable. So here I plot the distribution of these categories inside each complement row, one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, and each substitute row, like two, five, so on and so forth. And uh, we can see from both plots, in for the complement rows, we find some complementary categories appearing in the same row. For example, the fruit and organic produce. And for substitute rows, apart from those only containing one category, and almost all of them contain these prepared produce, which is a prepared version of the other products. So they can serve the same purpose. So this is also consistent with our understanding of substitutes as well as complements. And then we turn to the correspondence between ingredients and flavor compounds. So uh, what we have done is to first match our products to their ingredients. And from here we can, together with their data, we can get the matching between our products and their flavor compounds. And then after this, we can test whether our substitutes share more flavor compounds because they can serve the same purpose. And here I plot the distributions of the relative number of shared flavor compounds in the plot. So from all product pairs on the left, from complementary pairs in the middle, and from substitute pairs on the right. So we can see the substitute pairs have a much higher probability to share all its flavor compounds with the other. So that is of value one here. So this is consistent with these products being substitutes. Finally, we use uh, mm, correspondence between ingredients and the recipes around the world. So what we have done is still first match our products to their ingredients, and then we can get a matching between our products and the recipes around the world. And then we can test whether our complements have a much higher probability to co-appear in more recipes because they work together. And still, I, I show the distributions of the relative number of the shared recipes from all product pairs on the left and complementary pairs in the middle and substitute pairs 
on the right. And uh, you know, clearly, complementary pairs have a much higher probability to share more recipes with each other. And this is confirmed with the Mann Whitney Wilkinson test of under distributions. And so, like all these data validate our extractive product relationship from some different perspectives. This is about all, our, all about our results. And now I can summarize our work and also give our future plans. Uh, so in this talk, uh, we have discussed our network-based approach to extract complements and substitutes from the sales data. And we have shown the results from an illustrative example where we know the true relationship. And also the real world sales data where we don't know the relationship, but we validate these results with our understanding of complements and substitutes. And also external data sites, the product hierarchy and the correspondence between ingredients and flavor compounds and recipe data site. Yeah. And then in the future, we plan to incorporate our analysis to the state-of-the-art demand forecasting models. And so as we mentioned in the very beginning, complements and substitutes are defined through this cross-price elasticity demand. So we would like to know the um, predictive power of our scores and also the product groups. And more interesting, we would like to analyze the, like the demand system when we impose some price change to the system and what will this system respond with network effects into account, motivated by this work. So one more thing before the end, so our work can not only be applied to these complement and substitute products, but also to more generally like cooperation and competition in the system. Last but not least, thank you for listening and I'm happy for any questions if you have. Thank you very much, you. Okay, so are there any questions? You can just uh, unmute if you want. I have one, but I don't know if anybody has one before. Okay, I'm gonna start. Um, really interesting talk, you. Uh, really nice ideas. Um, so I've got quite a few things that I want to discuss with you, but. The first thing is, that is in my mind is obviously these are very, very large data sets when they're real, no? when, when you look at the Tesco data. Um, and I do remember seeing that you, at some point, obviously you do have a sum over the baskets, no? like product type, product J, sum over baskets L, right? Yeah. And, and I think there is no way around summing over baskets, no? but how many times do you do it? And is this a big bottleneck? Is that the only bottleneck you have? You mean in the real data, right? Yeah, so if you apply your method, yeah. um, is this, I imagine this could be the largest bottleneck. Um, but yeah, I you think so, lot. yeah, the number of but transactions. Like, and you only do it once, right? Do you? Yeah, like, yeah, I only do it once, then I use the scores. Okay, Yeah. so it's not incredibly, terrible right like it's only scales like the size of uh the number of baskets that you have yeah yeah it is it really is okay really interesting thank you thank you <laughs> any other questions well, i can ask as well um i was wondering because the the like this detection of complementary uh, products sounds very similar to like link prediction tasks in the network, right? Because you're you're basically saying if I have a, a product that has like uh, a lot of neighbors in common with another product, then one extra product that that other thing has. Well, sorry, it's not a good explanation, but it's similar to link prediction, right? Um, have you thought about that connection or? I think we thought about link connection, like link prediction sometimes with Renault. And well, I can't remember why we get rid of it in the end. Yeah, I mean, and it's just a new way to do link prediction, right? <laughs> in a yeah, sense. Yeah. I guess that's, that's like the second part of my, of my 
question more or less like this could also be thought of as a new way to do link prediction then i guess oh right i mean yeah. um okay i see yeah. it's like a way to solve this link prediction problem yeah or it's similar in a sense i think i see mm. that's a good idea i would think of it yeah <laughs> yeah yeah um and i was wondering yeah it's like finding substitutes it's a bit different right yeah yeah it's, uh, is that the harder yeah. of the two if you yeah i think so mm -hmm. yeah because you sort of have to exclude things or like find things that they don't have in common or something or just yeah, yeah it has more complex patterns that's why it's harder to extract from the data mm -hmm. Um, and then one more question I had was um, when you showed this table where you said like for blueberries, these are like the top three scoring ones, complementary and then the top three. Yeah. Um, so is there, do you know the reason why like the complementary sco complementarity score seems to be like much lower than the substitutability scores? Is there like a normalization thing that makes sense that they would be lower? Often, I I think because our complementarity score is from the product purchase network. Mm -hmm. So there are loads of transactions there. And our substitutability score is based on this complementarity score between products. Okay, so it's so like it's one in a smaller three. scale. Yeah, okay. So is it true that the second one is on the smaller network or? Yeah, yeah, the second one yeah. is on the smaller one. Okay. And do you think because like theoretically you could still get one for complementarity, I suppose. Yeah. If it's just like very unlikely, but essentially. Yeah, oh. if you have lots of transactions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, these results look pretty cool, I thought. Makes sense, Thank right? <laughs> they make sense. And I wanted to just comment, like it's funny how for the substitutability, substitutability, you can swap like an organic product for the non-organic version or vice versa, I guess. Yeah. So it's like a part that you can get rid of, but not so much for the complementary, right? If you're buying organic, you're still going to complement it with organic. Yeah. So that that I find quite interesting. Oh, that's actually an interesting point. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good. Is there any other question? Otherwise, oh, I have one more thing I was thinking about. Um, yes, yeah, so, so well, then one thing, one other thing I thought about is like you sort of have transitivity between like complementarity and, and substitutability, right? Like if one thing is complementary to another, that one is to yet another, then you also sort of expect that the first one is complementary to the third. So that's also a bit what you do when you group everything together. Yeah. You think there's a way to sort of use that when you already have learned some complementarity to boost like the learning of a new product because you already know sort of what certain groups are of complementarity product, complementary products. You just have to fit them into one of these groups or something. I mean, if we have a new product. Yeah, imagine like a new product comes in uh, then instead of like having to run the whole analysis again, you could just compare it to either of these categories or something. Oh, right. Oh, I see. I haven't thought about it yet. Yeah, yeah but or I'm thinking that mm -hmm. if I have a new product, we can somehow compare it with our like existing products to try to fit in. Mm -hmm. And also because then if, if that works, then you can also just run it first on half of all the products, cluster things, and then sort of add them in. And if that's cheaper, it's a bit related to what Rodrigo was saying as well. Then you don't uh, maybe have to run like the whole comparison again. It's already have sort of, I don't know if that would work. Like you would probably get a bit less accurate things. But... Yeah, but it's interesting to think about it. It's really to increase the efficiency. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? 
No. Okay. And uh, thanks again. You it was super nice Thank talk. You. And congratulations on on the paper. Where did you submit the paper actually? Oh, EPG did it twice. Okay. Cool. You mean when or where? I can where, where? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It's APG yeah. data size. Okay, cool. Well, yeah. thank you, and thank you everyone for coming. See you next yeah. week. Thank you. That was yeah. so Sherry. Yeah. Bye. Right, see you. Bye. Thank you. Well done. Thank you.